Good evening. It's so good to see you. It's so good to be with you again. I want us to start in John chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. That will serve as our starting place tonight. And while you're turning there uh, to John 1, 11 through 14, let me express my gratitude um, to Ray and all that uh, he has done on the hard work um, he's put into making this meeting happen. And um, he's doing all the uh, work with the PowerPoints, and I appreciate him so very much for that. Um, although it may be Kay doing that, um, he shakes his head, and uh, he's taking credit for it because this is in public. But anyway, I appreciate uh, Ray very much. I appreciate Mike and John uh, leading us this evening. I, I don't know of a, of a more dedicated personal worker than John Sawyer. And um, it's a joy to be with John and Alice, some longtime friends. And speaking of friends, it's so good to have uh, so many friends here tonight, uh, people I love and admire and appreciate and, and some I work with, and they still came. <laughs> but uh, I, I appreciate them very, very much supporting us and encouraging us. What did people do with Jesus in the New Testament, in the days when Jesus walked on this earth during his ministry. More importantly, what will we do with Jesus today? Let's talk about it. John is the author, the Apostle John. He's the speaker in this passage. He begins in verse 11. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What will we do with Jesus? We have looked at things most surely believed. We talked about the Bible. We talked about the Christian home. We talked about the church. We talked about God's grace. Tonight we talk about Jesus. And then tomorrow night, Lord willing, things will surely be believed across. It's one of those surveys that you see on Facebook. Now I'm not on Facebook, I'm a Christian. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I really am. Um, to, to say that, I'm condemning my wife, which is not uh, the best course of action uh, for your marriage, uh, because Kathy is on Facebook. But she's on Facebook for all the right reasons. And uh, that's to keep up with our kids and our, and our grandkids, and that's to keep up with our friends and what's going on in other congregations, who's in the hospitals, and anniversaries and birthdays. She makes me look really good. Because she tells me everything that's on Facebook. So why do I need to be on Facebook? Like everything else in our marriage, she tells me what to do and what's going on, and I just say, yes, ma'am. Happy wife, happy life. But a survey is one that you would see in a number of different places. The question was, who is the greatest human being that ever lived? And the answers were the obvious ones, like the physicist Albert Einstein or the English playwright William Shakespeare, or United States presidents like Abraham Lincoln, Jesus made the list, the top 10 list. He was number two. What's amazing to me is they put Jesus in the category of just another human being. He was just a man. He was a good man. He might have even been a great man, but he's simply a man. And he may be someone who did extraordinary things, the founder of a world religion even, but he is not what we believe him to be, and that's the Son of God. C.S. Lewis, in his little book, Mere Christianity, said of Jesus, he is either Lord, liar, or lunatic. In other words, C.S. Lewis was saying, you have to make a decision about Jesus. What will you do with Jesus? That question still comes to us again and again, even today. What we
we think of Jesus determines what we do with him. And what we do with him determines our destiny, our eternal home. So it's important for us to contemplate what people did with Jesus in biblical times. But more importantly, what will we do with him tonight, today, tomorrow, the rest of our lives. So think with me very briefly about what some did with Jesus in the Bible. For example, the Jews rejected him. That's why I began with this passage. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Translation, they rejected him. In other words, they didn't accept his claims. And what were his claims? He claimed to be God in the flesh. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the long-awaited Messiah. What did they think of that? They crucified him. They rejected him. Not all of them, of course. His followers, many of them, early on, were Jews. And those on the day of Pentecost that obeyed the gospel were Jews. So not all of them rejected Jesus, but the vast majority of them did. Josephus is a name you may recognize. He wrote a, a series of historical books about the Jews entitled Antiquities. And in those collections of books, and Josephus was born in 37 AD. That's four short years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. His parents, if they were still living at the time, and I'm assuming they were, they had seen Jesus. They might have heard Jesus. And there were people that Josephus would grow up to know who had actually met Jesus, who had actually seen Jesus. So Jesus, uh, Josephus knew a little bit about Jesus. About 40 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Josephus began to write his history of the Jewish people. Among many of his remarks is this one that I found interesting. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. Josephus tells you he was a man. He might have been an exceptional man. He might have been a good teacher, a great teacher, a great rabbi. But that's all he was. In other writings of Josephus, he will declare that Jesus lived, that Jesus died on the cross, that he was buried in a tomb, but it was reported that his disciples had come and stolen his body out of the tomb and had hidden it somewhere. Well, that's how Matthew's gospel ends. You remember they were bribed. The soldiers were bribed to spread their room. And Matthew will tell you at the end of his gospel, that rumor was still true when he was writing. He writes about 62 AD. Josephus starts writing his historical account about 75, 77 AD because he talks about the fall of Jerusalem. You know how many Christians died in the fall of Jerusalem? None. Not one. Many Jews lost their lives, of course. But Christians, when they saw the Roman army approaching and they would besiege the city and just wait them out and starve them out, Christians got out of town. And not one of them perished, which is phenomenal, but that's the power of Jesus' word. You believe and trust his word, it will save your life, and it will certainly save your soul. But Jesus dealt with a stubborn, obstinate group of people who would not believe him, no matter how much good he did. But Jesus warned them when he said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. There are people today who still reject Jesus. And if they remain that way, they will die in their sins. Does that not make you uncomfortable? How uncomfortable do you think it made Jesus? Because they were lost. And they didn't want to be found. And they didn't want to be saved. And Jesus, who could have saved them, couldn't because they wouldn't. There are still people today who are rejecting Jesus. And they need to be confronted. And they need to see the evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. The Jews rejected him. Number two, what about Pilate? Well, Pilate tried to wash his hands of Jesus. You know, Pilate is an interesting study in and of himself. He seems to be somewhat spineless. And if you remember that he interviewed Jesus and he examined Jesus at least seven times in the Gospel accounts, he tried to, to let Jesus go. 
And, and he knew it was out of envy that the Jews had delivered Jesus to him to begin with. Matthew 27, 18. So he knew what was happening. And you remember when he was struggling to let him go. That is Jesus. But the mob wasn't having anything to do with it. You remember his wife came to him? Um, in Matthew 27, 19. She had a dream about him. And she said to her husband, don't have anything to do with this righteous man. And you know, Pilate never did listen to his wife. Why would he listen now? He should have. It would have changed and saved his life. Pilate tried to release Jesus and condemn Barabbas. Barabbas was a criminal. He was an insurrectionist. He was a murderer. He was a thief. He deserved to die. So Pilate, who had this tradition every year at the Passover, he would parade out a prisoner and he would release one of them to the crowd, to the Jews, to pacify them, to keep them at arm's length or bay. And so he brought out Barabbas and he brought out Jesus, the man he declared to be the king of the Jews. And he thought, I really believed he thought or hoped at least, they would accept Jesus and not Barabbas. But they didn't want Jesus. They wanted him dead and they wanted Barabbas. Which is ludicrous. And I've often wondered as Barabbas stood there, had he ever seen Jesus before? Had he ever even heard of Jesus before? I mean, here he is standing there condemned to die. He's going to the cross and Jesus steps forward and takes his place. Just like he did for you. Just like he did for me. And I wonder when Barabbas was set free, what that meant to him. That Jesus set him free. What does it mean to us? For Jesus to set us free. And it's amazing to me to think about what Barabbas did once he got back out in the crowd and once they led Jesus away to crucify him. Do you think Barabbas followed him? Do you think Barabbas went out to Calvary or Golgotha and watched Jesus die? Do you think he did that? I don't know if he did or not. Maybe he was curious, but I've wondered many times, if he did, did it change anything about his life? Did he simply go back to do the things he had done before? Did he get in trouble? Or did he see in Jesus, as John prayed, a man who just paid his debt? What will we do with Jesus? And what will we do when we spend a little time at the cross? Will it change us? Will it motivate us? Will we be different? Will we be better? Will we try harder? Pilate was so weak. You remember Pilate brought out water and he washed his hands, Matthew 27, 24. And you remember he said, I am innocent of this man's blood. He washed his hands. I'm innocent of this man's blood. There's a tradition and it's just a tradition. It's not in the Bible, but it is in secular writings that date back to a time not long after that, after the time of Jesus. And the tradition states that Pilate could not keep the unrest in Jerusalem under control. There were several more insurrections after Jesus' death, and Jerusalem became a mess. The Jews wouldn't pay their taxes, and so Vespasian, the emperor, sent his general Titus to level Jerusalem to the ground. And it was Pilate unable to keep them happy, politically happy. They were a thorn in the side of Rome all the days of Pilate's life and the, the emperor's life. So he banished Pilate. He banished him. He exiled him according to tradition. And Pilate lived out the rest of his life in prison, essentially. And tradition says he tried every day for the rest of his life to get the blood of Jesus off his hands. He could not wash his hands enough to remove the guilt of killing an innocent man. And he may have said he was innocent, but in verse 26, the Bible says, Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he... Pilate delivered him to be crucified. He will forever be remembered in history as the man who crucified the son of the living God. In Shakespeare's play, Macbeth, you remember Macbeth killed the king, but 
he left his daggers in the king's chamber. Lady Macbeth went after them and gathered them together, and they came back, and they were both feeling guilty already, and they tried to hide the daggers, but Shakespeare wants us to understand that the guilt they felt was not so conveniently dismissed because they tried to wash their hands and Macbeth, Lady Macbeth rather, would spend her life, the rest of the play, trying to wash the blood of an innocent man off her hands. She couldn't do it. Today, there is a psychological ailment called Macbeth's syndrome, where someone habitually washes his or her hands, trying to remove the guilt and sin or stain or whatever is troubling them from their lives. And it never works. Pilate tried to wash his hands of Jesus. You can't do that with Jesus. He doesn't just conveniently go away. There will be a reckoning day. There will be a day of accountability. But you must decide what to do with Jesus and their consequences with either one of the choices. And why did he, why did he crucify Jesus anyway? Politically advantageous. Do you know anybody who does what they do because it's politically advantageous? Do you know anybody who fails or refuses and won't do certain things because it is politically not advantageous for them to do it? And so here's Pilate, according to Mark 15, 15, who had Jesus crucified because it gratified or satisfied or pacified, some grace, I should say, the Jews. All right? The Jews rejected him. Pilate tried to wash his hands of him. Judas betrayed him. And we learned in Matthew 26, 14 through 16, that he betrayed our Lord for 30 pieces of silver. He double-crossed him, right? This is the ultimate Brutus, who is stabbing Julius Caesar in the back. He betrayed him. And what's more, he betrayed him with a kiss. And you'll remember in verse 49 of Matthew 27 that Jesus, when he comes up to him and Judas kisses him, which singles to the mob, this is the guy, Jesus referred to him as his friend. Friend, why have you come? Do you think Jesus knew? But did Judas... Judas essentially double-crossed our Lord, and it must have broken his heart. And there is a tradition, again, that is not in the Bible, but is apocryphal, that Jesus and Judas were best friends growing up. Have you ever wondered why Jesus referred to him as a friend, and why Jesus would have chosen him as an apostle? And why Jesus would have spent three and a half years basically trying to change him. They were friends. They had known each other. And Jesus loved him and tried to save him. But of course, Judas did not want to be saved. In Luke's account in Luke 22, 48, when Judas came to Jesus and kissed him, Jesus said to him, Judas... Are you betraying the Son of God with a kiss? It's horrific. It's the ultimate Benedict Arnold. But I'll tell you this about Judas. He may have sold out the Lord for 30 pieces of silver, but you know and I know many people today who sell him out for far less. <laughs> Greed's a powerful motivator, isn't it? Jesus preached more on materialism than any other said. So why does Judas do what he does? Well, he's a thief. And it's Paul who rightly says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows and have erred from the faith. There's no greater example than Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed the Lord and will forever be remembered as such. So Judas betrayed him. But what did Peter do with him? Did not Peter deny him? I mean, Peter in Matthew 26, ironically, at the end of the chapter, 69 through 75, basically lied three times. I don't know who he is. I've never met the man. And if Judas betrayed the Lord once, did not Peter betray him three?
three times? Well, I mean, what's the difference? Some money exchanged? Which, uh, which is the worst sin? Which is the most difficult to, to comprehend when Peter supposedly was right in Jesus' corner? And, and it, was, it was Peter who said, I'll die for you, Lord. I will. But when push came to shove, Peter caved and denied the Lord three times. Denied he ever knew him. And it's interesting that in Luke 22, 61 and 62, when that last denial occurred, Peter and Jesus turned at the same time and locked eyes. And the very next verse says that Peter went out and wept bitterly because he knew that Jesus knew what he had done. And how do you outrun that? <coughs> when you do what Peter did, you ask Jesus to forgive you. May I ask you something? If Judas had asked the Lord to forgive him, would the Lord have forgiven him? I believe he would. Without question. But Judas didn't know the Lord as Peter did. And Peter would turn his life around and for the right reasons. Now why did Peter deny the Lord? Let me tell you what some uh, um, kids talked about in this Bible class. When I was seven years old, here's what he said. He thought he would never deny his master. And here's Kelsey, seven years old. Peter forgot to have faith in Jesus. Here's Kyle, age six. He was weak. And here's Ray, age six. He forgot that God was in control. And Tommy, age six. Peter denied Jesus three times because he forgot that he had power in God. Out of the mouths of babes, God has perfected praise. Why did Peter deny the Lord? Why? Self-preservation. And that's a strong motivation to just deny Christ to save your own life. And Peter was guilty of that. And Peter would have to live with that the rest of his life. But Peter became a powerful advocate for the forgiveness of God in Jesus. What did the other disciples do with Jesus? Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. What did the other disciples do? They fled the scene. Right. Isn't that what it says in Matthew 26 or 66? That when they arrested Jesus and they took Jesus away, the Bible says, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. The Greek word for fled is the word stampede. Now get this. They were in so big a hurry to get out of there that they literally were running over each other. They couldn't get away fast enough because they're scared to death. And they see themselves hanging on crosses next to Jesus. And they're fair weather followers of Jesus. When it was good, they were right there with them. But when discipleship cost them their lives, they weren't ready to make that sacrifice. And there are people in our world today who are being persecuted for their faith. And every day they're making that decision. That's what they choose to do with Jesus. They don't renounce him when the going gets tough. And his disciples were cowards. They were cowards. And many of us are cowards. Life makes cowards out of us so often. And we struggle and we work hard and we try better. But it's, it's a constant reminder of our fallen world and the human dilemma, the weakness that's in all of us. Jesus knew this. Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 41, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. And we would agree with that wholeheartedly. Well, running out of time, what did Saul of Tarsus do with him? Well, Saul of Tarsus persecuted him. Now, we understand, Paul will say in 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, he was the worst of all sinners. In other words, I'm the worst of all of them. You put all of them um, in a line, and, and I'm at the head of that line. Um, you list them all, I'm at the top of that list. If you back up to verse 13 of 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul will tell you, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. Translation, a violent man. 
Now we looked at 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10 last night. We'll not revisit that, except in verse 9, where Paul says, I'm the least of all the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. That's what Saul of Tarsus did with him. But to think of his violent nature and his anger and how vehemently he opposed Jesus and the church. Look at Acts 22, verse 20, where Paul says, when you're martyred, when his blood was being shed, I was standing by also, consenting unto his death, and guarding the garments of those who were killing him. While Stephen was shedding his blood for Christ, Saul stood there and did not lift a finger, and he guarded the clothes of those who did the, the dastardly deed. He was as guilty as anyone else, of course. But Saul's life would change, and, and Saul would turn it around, and this is what he would do with him, ultimately, what he would do with Jesus eventually, when Ananias, he saw the light. Saul saw the light, literally, on the road to Damascus, didn't he? And it woke him up. And Ananias, somewhat reluctantly, went to him. And Paul said, you want to know what he said to me? Let me, let me tell you what he told me. This is Acts 22, 16. This is Paul himself. And now why tarry himself? Arising at that time, washing away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And he didn't have to ask Paul twice. Why did Paul persecute the church? Because he thought he was right. Saul was a good man, a good Jew, a good Pharisee. He thought he was right. He said, I've lived in all good conscience up until this day, as he's trying to explain his former life in Acts 23, verse 1. But the conscience is only as good as it is educated or as it is instructed, or as it is guided, right? If it is not filled with the proper knowledge, the conscience is a terrible guide. But if it is filled with the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, the conscience can be an excellent guide. Paul, Saul, was misguided. Do you know anybody like that today? who think they're right, who believe they're right, who are simply living out of what they believe to be a good conscience, they're misinformed. Unfortunately, they've been fooled. They're misguided. They need someone to help them, obviously. But there are a number of people who have done this with Jesus. They haven't gotten the complete story. Saul had not seen the entire picture. But when he did, he obeyed the gospel. Our task is to help a lost and dying world see the whole scheme of redemption, God's plan of salvation. Finally, what do you do with Jesus? Well, the Jews rejected him. Pilate tried to wash his hands of him. Judas double crossed him. Peter denied him. The disciples forsook him. Saul of Tarsus persecuted him, renounced him. But the Ethiopian nobleman obeyed him. When you go to the story of his conversion in Acts chapter 8, you remember he had been to Jerusalem and he was going home. And where was home? Gaza. He's on his way home to Gaza. And he's reading from Isaiah 53 and he doesn't understand what he's reading. And he's searching. And don't you know God knew that? And, and God sent the evangelist Philip to him. And Philip caught up with him to his chariot and asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? The world needs to be guided. The world is lost. It's up to us as Jesus' disciples to help them see what the Bible is saying, to help guide them through the scriptures. Scriptures, many of them do not understand, of course. So... Philip joined him in the chariot. Verse 35 says, And he began to sing scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He began right where he found the nobleman. 
He started in Isaiah 53, which is about the cross, about the crucifixion of Jesus, the reason why he had to die on the cross. He goes through all of that, but somewhere in that gospel sermon, he got the baptism. And that's where verse 36 picks up. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What did hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. That's what happens when you obey Jesus. Prior to that, your life's a mystery. And your life is lost. But you obey Jesus, you follow Jesus, you live for Jesus as we sang a moment ago, and you will live your life blessed by Him, thus happy as the eunuch returned home. And I can only imagine that when he got home, he told everybody he knew about Jesus Christ. And that's how the church in Gaza began. Now, may I ask you something before we close? <coughs> If a man can be saved by just believing in Jesus, why was the chariot commanded to stand still? If someone can pray a sinner's prayer and be saved, and there's no sinner's prayer in the Bible, you know that. But if you could do that and you could be saved, why stop the chariot? If faith only saves, then pray tell me, why stop the chariot? And if baptism is essential for the forgiveness of sins, why stop the chariot? It's obvious, isn't it, that baptism was essential. It was necessary. It was the only way in which to be saved. The eunuch knew that. Philip knew that. The Lord knew that. And that's why the chariot was commanded to stand still. And may I ask you also, if you can sprinkle a little water on a person's head and they're saved or baptized, or you pour some water on someone's head and they're baptized. And you know, there are people who believe that. There are people who still practice that today. And there are churches of Christ who accept that baptism. Without reservation. May I ask you this? Why did they have to go down into the water? Why get wet? Why not just take a glass or a pitcher or something if you have it handy and just dip up some water? Pray tell me why they stopped the chariot. And why was it so important that they found water, enough water, for him to be immersed? It's clear, isn't it? In our text, as John continues, the Jews didn't receive him, but look at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Isn't that ironic? Were not the Israelites God's people? Were they not the children of God? Is that what they're referred to in the Bible as in the Old Testament? Are they not still considered that even today in our world? But according to John 1, 11 and 12, if they reject Jesus, they're not children of God. Who are the real children of God? Those who receive Jesus, as a nobleman did. Jesus goes on to say, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. They are born again of water and the Spirit. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What will we do with Jesus? Now, what do we do with this lesson? As we come to the end, Larry King probably interviewed everybody and anybody, right? He was considered the Edward R. Morrow of his generation, the greatest interviewer. And Larry King asked some really pointed questions. But on this occasion, the person he was interviewing said, Larry, do you mind if I ask you a question? And that reversed the roles. And so now the interviewee is interviewing the interviewer. 
And the question he asked Larry King, Larry King seemed fun, so, and you could tell he was surprised. But he said, okay. And you know the question he asked him? If you could ask God one question, what would it be? If you could ask God one question, well, what would it be? I've thought about that a lot. Larry King thought about it too. And then Larry King responded by saying, I think I would ask God, do you have a son? Larry King was a Jew. He was born to immigrant parents in this country. But he lived and died a Jew. Would that not be an important question to ask him? But was not that question already answered? So if the first time he hears an answer to that question it was in the day of judgment, I think that's why Larry King, if he had one question to ask God, that be it. And it makes me sad that people stand before God not knowing Jesus and they're lost eternally. There's nothing good in that. It just weighs on my heart. So we have the obligation to answer those questions for them. We sing a hymn and we'll sing it now. What will you do with Jesus? And that last part of the chorus what will we do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, what will Jesus do with me? And what Jesus does with us then is what we do with him now. And if you're here this evening and you're not a Christian, what have you been doing with Jesus? And if you have the opportunity tonight to do the right thing with our Lord, Will you do it? Or if you're here tonight and you're a Christian and you're no longer bearing your cross for our Lord, what have you done with Jesus? Where have you put him? Where is he in your priorities? Maybe tonight you're ready to be restored and start your walk again. That's the right thing to do with Jesus. Why together we stand and say. One, two, three.